Hello, and welcome to A-State Sports Take. I'm your host, James Lowry. In this segment, I'm joined by Marquise Esther and Austin Sweat. How are y'all today? I'm doing awesome. Doing well. All right, the topic for this segment is, should we or should we not expand the college football playoff? Should, should it be chosen by the committee or by computers? So what do you guys think, man? I'm against it. I'm always against um, adding more teams just because, yes, for one thing, you, you're going to have the same old, same old teams every year, and these small schools can't really compete against these bigger schools. Like, example, last year, Cincinnati versus Alabama. Alabama exploited Cincinnati's weakness, and he just wanted to prove that Alabama is one of the, one of the great teams, but the young, younger, these smaller schools can't really compete with the bigger schools. But I think uh, expanding it gives them a chance to be able to work up to doing that. You know, you expand it, you have so many more slots available. You have so much more openness. So maybe a school that would get looked out previously is now able to get in. Because you look back to a lot of the times, it used to be two teams and they just solely went with that. And then they expanded to four like we have now. And, you know, college football playoffs, one of the most viewed things. My parents are so excited for it every year, and it's just one of the cornerstones of, like, watching football. I think expanding that will do great for both the teams that get to go in it because now this team has a shot, this team has a shot, and it's going to bring in more money. So logistically for them, that's going to be great because college football is watched, especially the playoffs, and so that will just bring up so much more revenue for them that it's a no-brainer to me for them to do that. It, oh, do you guys like feel like it'll help with the um, ESPN like TV contract as well? Because I mean they're already on TV. ESPN already hosts it. Their contract is up in 2024. Like, do you guys not feel like the academic calendar and all that stuff coming into play with all these teams trying to join the college football playoff? How do you do? Y'all feel like it's gonna be just too much chaos or? It's just See, that's a tricky question because like it can go <laughs> either, either way, but here's my thing though. Like you got this, like Western Michigan is another example. Since, like since like Cincinnati when I talked about earlier, mm-hmm. if, if, even if those guys do get in playing against one of the best teams like Alabama, the LSU, the Ohio State, how are they gonna peak against this, these bigger schools? Yes, it'd be more money for uh, schools and for the conference, but. We need more competitive games, and I don't see it being competitive. But we've seen things like, let's be honest, Texas A&M is not one of the best teams out there. But they have consistently put up a fight against Bama. Mm-hmm. And I think these smaller teams, while they're overlooked, and, yeah, not a lot of them will not put up that fight, a lot of them will be able to put up some type of fight somewhere. And I think it's a matter of just in the end, that's going to be the better team, and that's just football. You are going to play teams better than you which is why Bama would likely be ranked higher than them, for example, in this thing. But, you know, you've seen this year, Bama hasn't been performing as well. They've lost a lot this year for them especially. And so I think that these teams will have a chance. But going into the academic calendar, I think with the um, the 2024 contract, Mm -hmm. I think that will be able to get time for them to work things before it happens. So if they were to start this right now, start the process, they could definitely schedule things a lot better to where it would be able to work out, and they could probably find that sweet spot for them to be able to expand it like this. But who, what team do you see actually be able to compete in a, like the high level, on the highest stage of them all against the highest stage? Yes, Alabama's not that good this year. They're good, but not not, not as dominant. Standards. But who, who, what small team going to beat Ohio State who's playing lights out? Michigan. You got all these bigger schools who have traditionally are power schools for a reason. Yes, you got, like, there's some schools like Coastal Carolina, for example, like a powerhouse for a um, mid-major. Too. But how can they compete against these bigger schools? And, again, it's just one of those takes of maybe they can't. And if they can't, that just stinks for them because, obviously, these people who want to go to the college championships, they're going to go to the places that are more likely to get in. But when you open up more slots, I think they'll have much better recruiting possibility, too. Because if they're a team that would be able to scrape into the, um, let's say, for example, if they're doing eight teams just to double it for, like they did before, then you could have a team going to the eight slot. People are more likely to go to that because then they can still get in the playoffs and still be noticed. And I think that will draw more people in where they can recruit better players to be able to be better teams. 
Speaking of your point to bringing more people in, it's that if they implement it in time, the new format that is, it could garner roughly $450 million in gross revenue. So, I mean, it can bring in some money, but I get what your point is oh, yeah. at the same time. But like, my thing is like, yeah, it's going to be bringing a lot of money. But the question is, though, are we going uh, to enjoy have, yeah, Are we going to enjoy As a fan, yeah. I want to see competitive football. And most times, like, you at these small, like, not, nothing against these small schools, but I want to see these, like, I want to see competitive games, like close games, not blowouts. Because, like, years past, we always had blowouts. Like, either whether it's Alabama, uh, in the past, Clemson. I want to see competitive games. But right now, I don't feel like these small schools have enough to hang with the big, uh, big time schools. So, where you're coming from is you would not like to see, um, let's see here, uh, a Coastal Carolina <laughs> versus a Clemson. Basically, is that what you're saying? No, because, like, yes, Coastal Carolina is good, really good. But you got Clemson, who as a powerhouse that recruit better. And I'm not getting that, taking anything away from Coastal Carolina, but you got the Clemsons, the LSU, like, those are schools that tri- like bring, schools. Like, bring guys, like, put people in the NFL, mm-hmm. got guys who compete at the highest level. And I, it's, it's like these small schools – there's some schools that are almost there, mm-hmm. but I want to see – I just want to see – I just don't see it working. But think about how awesome it is to see these little schools beat the bigger ones. Those yeah. are some of my favorite games ever. <laughs> whether it's my – whether it's the team I'm rooting for or not that get beat, it's always so fun to see just the chaos it sends everything in because everyone is just like, oh, my gosh, how did this happen? What, what does this mean for future rankings? What does this mean for the future of the school? And it just, I think it throws so much extra flair in to have them be able to have the chance to beat them. Because let's be honest, you look in so many sports movies and stuff, you see the underdog story. We love the underdog story. And to see it play out in real life is always so much fun. But I get that, but. It's not like, you know, yes. Like, when's the last time a small school being a powerhouse school in the, in the playoffs alone? Like, it's really. We don't get to see that option because yeah, there's not enough slots. Yeah, it's not enough slots. But I still think they should keep it the way it is. Yeah. Yes, it needs some work, but I also think we should not change it because, like, these small schools won't have a chance. Like, yes, they have the money, the exposure. Like, it helped them recruiting. But what about the competitive, like, having a competitive game? Like, what about that? I just – I think it's a matter of, you know, if they are good enough, they will get in first off. Because if they're not that great – we're not saying we have to limit it to this many teams from here or this many teams from here. And so if they're not up to par, they probably won't get in. And so you're going to have, I mean, think of like NFL playoffs. You have always your top team has a bye, and then you're going to have like the highers play the lower, te- the lower seeds. So you're going to get that. You get that NFL, you would get that here probably. And so I think that's just part of what you'll have to say. But again, they always, I think, if they're getting in the playoffs, they're going to have some reason that they're there and they are going to be fighting. Because you, you don't think that, te- that scrappy little team that was able to get in that lower seat isn't going to put in everything they got against that higher team. And I think that's at least going to give them physical football. And I think we'll have some type of game. Of course, you won't always. Like, that's just a matter of football. Sometimes you're going to see teams get blown out. You're going to see that in regular season. You would see that in playoffs. But I think it's so hard to just – only off the fact of, like, oh, hey, some t- games might not be as good to dismiss it, that is so hard to make that case. Because think of the revenue you gain. Think of the, um, you know, possibilities it brings to schools, the possibility it brings to recruitment. And to go into your point, it lets teams that have playoff shots like that build. Because if you can get it on a team that goes to playoffs, then let's say you're a player that's trying to build up their skill and stuff, you'll get more. And you get more reps there than you would at, like, you know, Alabama, Clemson. And so there you were able to build up your reps, get better, and possibly get scouted for NFL. I think it just builds up a lot. Well, that's all the time we have for this segment. We'll be right back with more A-State Sports Take right after this. ASU TV, shows like Red Wolf Roundtable, ASU TV News, West Side Football, and more. 
gain real life experience while doing what you love. Get involved with ASU TV today. ASU TV, covering all your favorite sports. From Red Wolf Roundtable to Westside Football and more, ASU TV has you covered. Tune in now to ASU TV for news and coverage on these sports and more. Here to deliver the latest news on A-State sports, ranging from football, basketball, baseball, and more. I'm your host, Tristan Harlan, alongside your other host, Cooper Mellor. Red Wolf Roundtable is your local sports source. Tune in to Red Wolf Roundtable to get your fix on sports talk and news. to A-State Sports Take. I'm your host, Caleb Gullahorn, and in this segment, I'm joined by Jacob Tester and Kobe Wood. The topic for this segment is the top 10 NBA basketball players of all time. So, uh, before we get into the list, I want to hear like some guys that just barely missed out on the cut, so some honorable mentions that you guys had. You want it, or you go uh, ahead. You go I'll ahead. go ahead. Uh, I got one honorable mention. Uh, it's Stephen Curry. Uh, unanimous MVP, four-time champ. So, I mean, with those types of stats, and he also changed the game completely, but he was literally just right outside my top 10. It was really hard for me to try and squeak him in there, but I'll have him at 11, I guess. I have Curry at 12. Okay. Because my number 11 is going to be one that a lot of people disagree with, and that's Kobe Bryant. But I think that once you, once you see my top 10 and I give my explanation, you'll probably understand. But I have Kobe at 11, but um, narrowly maybe, outside maybe of my top 10. <laughs> I thought I disrespected Kobe with this list, but you made him worse than I uh, did. So, bad. hey, I mean, not my having bad. Kobe in the top 10 is kind of crazy. We'll see. Well, we'll see. I, mean, I have good points. Goes, I have so. valid points. Who do you guys got as your number 10? Uh, number 10, I have Tim Duncan. Uh, the 10 I had Duncan. The, yeah, 10 Duncan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the reason I had him so low is compared to the rest of the players on my list, uh, he wasn't as flashy as the rest of these guys that are on here. When you're talking about the greatest, you have to do eye catch test as well. Well, Mr. Fundamentals was great for the Spurs and probably their best player of all time. Absolutely. Uh, he just wasn't flashy enough for me to pass these other guys up. I'll get to Tim Duncan in a minute, but I had him a little bit higher than you. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't measure it by flashiness. I measure it by greatness and accolades but also the era. But anyway, my number 10 is Hakeem Olajuwon. Um, I, I think that he's the most skilled big man in NBA history, great defensive player. Uh, the dream shake was something that a lot of NBA players modeled their skill after. Um, only player to win regular season MVP, finals MVP, and defensive player of the year in the same season. And I, he has the most blocks in NBA history. Uh, great defensive player, often overlooked. Absolutely. I, I really like that Hakeem pick right there. Uh, so going on now to number nine, who do you got coming I have in? Shaquille O'Neal at number nine. Uh, 23.7 points, almost 11 rebounds a game, four championships, three finals MVPs, arguably the most dominant player that yeah. we've ever seen. Yeah. Though when he had such a weakness when it came to shooting that hack a shack was a thing, <laughs> yeah, that, that type of weakness just keeps me from putting him too high as the rest of those players, in my opinion, didn't kind of have that outlandish weakness. I agree having Shaquille in the top 10 to 8 range, but I have Wilt Chamberlain at 9. Uh, I think he may be the most dominant big man in NBA history, but Shaq, I think, was the most dominant in, in his era. Mm -hmm. 
but overall, I feel like Wilt was the most dominant. Um, average 50, over 50 points a game and 25 uh, rebounds per game in the same season. And yes, you can give the whole argument of he played against milkmen and firefighters, but I don't think that's necessarily the case because there's only eight teams in the league and he had to play Bill Russell 11 mm -hmm. of those times. Um, he was a regular season stat stuffer and there's not a ton of postseason success. That's why I have, I have him lower on my top ten. Right, and Wilt's one of the craziest physical specimens that we've yes. ever seen. I mean, great, two, yeah. forty, he could bench five hundred. I mean, I don't know so, how so accurate many that stories is. Stories and myths about this dude. It's hard to believe that a guy like that was even real. Right. You know. So moving on. Maybe to he wasn't eight on the list. Uh, I mean, who knows? Who knows? Who was your number eight? Uh, here's where I thought I was going to get disrespected. Uh, I had Kobe Bryant at eight. Uh, five championships, only one MVP, though. He's obviously known for his elite scoring ability, and his defense was very underrated and definitely not talked about enough. But his concerns as, like, an actual teammate was kind of what held me back for putting him really high on this list, though he did have what is known as the Mamba mentality, which is his dedication to the game was pretty much unmatched oh. that we've ever seen. So for that reason, he obviously, for me, had to be on the list. Having Kobe at eight is very fair. I could have him at eight as well, but I went the route of Shaq took him to those first three championships. Kobe was still very young. Uh, Shaq does have a four – by the way, Shaq is my number eight. Sorry. Shaq is number eight for me, which goes hand in hand, kind of with yours. Shaq went four and two in the finals, won three of those with Kobe. Kobe was five and two in the finals. But you're right about Kobe. He had, let's see here, uh, 12 all-defense selections. So that's very great for him. But Shaq, like I said, was the most dominant big man in his era. Absolutely. Rest in peace, the Mamba. I mean, tragic mm -hmm. death. We're going to have to run through these real quick. Yeah. Let's so, just lightning round it. So, yeah, so seven. Uh, Wilt Chamberlain, I won't touch on him too much since he has already mentioned. 100-point right. game, averaged 50 in a season. That's pretty much enough said, even though the competition obviously wasn't the best. Larry Bird, for me, very skilled, high IQ. I like that. And then, so moving on now to number six. This is when I have Larry Bird. I mean, him and Magic revitalized the game in the NBA and saved it. And he just played at a different tempo compared to other players. So, I mean, when you see something like that, his footwork was incredible. Yeah, so he, he played his own game and mm -hmm. didn't let anybody change that. Number six, uh, Tim Duncan. Uh, very fundamental. Five and one record. And if it wasn't for that game seven win for the Heat in 2014, 13 then he would have an undefeated record. So, so Tim Duncan for me. Yeah. So now we're into the top five, and this is where I think pretty much we're going to have the same players or we should. Yes, I think so. Uh, so go on. And who do you got number five, Jacob? Number five, I have Bill Russell. Uh, 11 championships in 13 years is absolutely insane, but his only competition was Wilt Chamberlain, uh, and, he off and he wasn't the best offensive threat and, like, the rest of these right. players were really high level when it comes to offensive efficiency. He just wasn't that. Right. But his 11 un championships is just something you can't ignore. He has to be top five. I've got Magic Johnson at five. Uh, probably the best point guard in NBA history. But I think his offense uh, outside of passing the ball was underrated as well. Mm -hmm. He can score it. Uh, at 6'9", you know, just flashy. So if you want to put him in your flashy top five, you can. <laughs> so top four now. Uh, number four is where I have Magic. Uh, you mentioned that he is 6'9". Uh, he was also able to guard every single position. Uh, in the finals, he started as a center. So, I mean, you don't see that right. with point guards these days, yeah. uh, which is just unheard of, especially since the big man's gotten bigger as well. Right. But his ability just to guard all positions and obviously his passing and scoring. Number four that. for me was Bill Russell, mm -hmm. and you pretty much hit on it earlier. Great, great defensive player, probably the greatest defender in NBA history. Not much left to say there. So now we're into the top three of all time. Mm. Uh, this is where I've got Kareem, uh, the current all-time leading scorer. He will get passed by someone that's a little bit higher than him on this list. But six MVPs, six championships, and then his obviously unstoppable sky hug. So. I've got LeBron at three. Mm. Uh, his, his ten finals appearances, though he went four and six, is very notable because it's in the modern era. Right. I mean, it's not like he's playing in the 60s. Uh, and two of those were against the stacked Warriors with Kevin Durant. I don't think you could have put Jordan on that team, mm -hmm. and he would have won. Nobody so. was beating that team. I've got LeBron at three. All right, top two. I have LeBron at two for this <laughs> one. Uh, the reason I put him above Kareem is I think LeBron's skill set is better. I mean, his IQ is one of the best that we've seen in a while. He uh, 
can really pass the ball. He can rebound, uh, and he's extremely athletic. So, and he's been such a, a long, healthy career yeah, with right. so, so much sustained success for him is why I've got him at two. I've got Kareem at two. Um, the most MVPs in NBA history was six. Uh, first all-time in points, although LeBron will probably pass him, and third in rebounds all-time, so I have Kareem at two. And number one. Come on now. You want to say it together? Yeah. Three, two, one. Michael, Michael Jordan. Jordan. There, we there we go. go. I mean, no surprise there. I mean, 6 and 0 oh in the finals. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't really got to explain. Dominated the, the 90s. Yeah. The two years he was mm -hmm. out, he was out with baseball. So, yeah. yeah, six championships, as we said, six finals MVPs as well to go with that. Five MVPs and even a defensive player of the year. Yep. And then there's obviously what he's even done off the floor with the whole Jordan brand that's completely grown. And take over almost the entire industry. Absolutely. So, I mean, his impact even outside of the game is just on GOAT status. The so, only I mean, thing he's got to he, be one. The only thing that he has shown that he can't do is run a team. And, I mean, just <laughs> look at what he's doing in Charlotte. Oh. That's pretty much the only thing he can't hey, do. Hey, let's mention he has 10 scoring titles as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That is a whopping number. He averaged yeah. 30 points a game for and, his entire and, season. In 1988 season, he got Defensive Player of the Year, had the scoring title, and he got MVP. So, to be able to do it on both sides of the floor like that is – that's insane. What, that's what separates him from pretty much anybody else is because he was great on both sides of the ball. Yeah. He never took a playoff. He mm -hmm. gave it his all every single time. Yep. So, I mean, I, I like the list that we came up with. I, th I think it's pretty consensus. We had the same amount of players. The only thing that I couldn't believe was Kobe not being in the top ten on your list. I know. So Kobe that's didn't have Kobe. Sorry. <laughs> all right, that's all the time we have left for this segment, and we'll be right back with more A-State Sports Talk right after this. ASU TV, shows like Red Wolf Roundtable, ASU TV News, Westside Football, and more. Gain real life experience while doing what you love. Get involved with ASU TV today. ASU TV, covering all your favorite sports. From Red Wolf Roundtable to Westside Football and more, ASU TV has you covered. Tune in now to ASU TV for news and coverage on these sports and more. to deliver the latest news on A-State sports, ranging from football, basketball, baseball, and more. I'm your host, Tristan Harlan, alongside your other host, Cooper Mellor. Red Wolf Roundtable is your local sports source. Tune in to Red Wolf Roundtable to get your fix on sports talk and news. to the eight state sports take. I'm Ella Jane Britt, and in this segment, I'm joined by Ivan Rash and Sad Nakui. The topic for this segment is, are professional racing drivers athletes? What is y'all's opinion on that? Okay, I'm gonna get right to the point, Ella Jane. They are athletes. Okay, see, dri driving a race car, it's, it's not as simple as, as just, well, driving a car, you see. Okay, it takes endurance, you know, you're, you're sitting in that thing for like, hundreds of laps, <laughs> heck, some, heck, in some racing series, you have to race for 24 hours, <laughs> if you can believe that. And it, it takes endurance, you know, you, you, gotta, 
You gotta get you gotta get into shape, get yourself energized, and be prepared to sit in, be prepared to sit in a, a somewhat confined space doing all sorts of things at once. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not that simple. So you said that they have to sit for 24 hours. So I, my question to you is that if you will travel, if you'll sit in your car from here and travel from here to New York, like for 16, 20 hours, so you are gonna call yourself an athlete too because you were sitting there for 20 hours. Yes, I am. Because so let me gonna, tell you, okay, that is that's a very long distance you're talking. Okay? okay. In fact, I think from here, from Arkansas to New York, that's that's more than 24 hours. Okay. It, it not not many. It's 16 hours. Yeah. Oh. To oh. correct you. Yep. Right. But my point still stands, though. It's it's a long time, and it it you gotta be you, you gotta. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So you call yourself an athlete, and you say that. So my question to you then is that. What is the definition for an athlete, according to you? Hmm. Let's see the definition of an athlete. Yep. Let's see. Um, hmm. Oof. Got to hand it to you, Syed. You. Uh, you. I didn't think it was possible, but uh, you've. You've stumped me. So I'm just going to say I've that. I've never really look, thought of it that So much. look, a definition for an athlete is a person who competes in one or more sports that involves physical strength, speed, or endurance. Mm. This means that their personal own physical strength, not their machine, the machine that they are sitting in. Mm. So, and apart from that, like, so what kind of racing are you talking about? Like, you're talking about NASCAR, you're talking about Formula One, drag racing. What kind of racing are you specifically talking about? Mm. Well, I'm... Um, I'm referring to to races that I'm referring to racing that takes like it takes a long time, you know. Think, let's see, NASCAR and NASCAR and Formula One, like you mentioned, but there's also IndyCar, and well, I there is also the 24 Hours of Le Mans that I was re referring to. <laughs> that one takes real guts, I can tell you. Look, my thing is that I don't say that it's I wouldn't say that it is easy to do it. Okay, I agree that it's hard, but as I just mentioned to you, the definition for an athlete is that you should have your own physical strength, your own body strength. If you're sitting in a machine and you are just driving a car, then it's not your, okay, I will say that yes, it is your own ability and capability of driving it, but I, like I just mentioned, if you're traveling from here and traveling like on a 24 hour trip to some place, so, According to you, you call yourself an athlete, but that's not an athlete, my friend, because an athlete is a person who works on his body, who works on his self, who's on his mental strength, on his physical strength, and then who you know competes in a, in a competition or in any sports. So my opinion is that um, you should go back and look into your you know definitions, and you because an athlete is uh, because drivers are. Uh, are not an athlete, even if you take F1 drivers, because I think Formula One racing is difficult than the NASCAR racing. That's my personal opinion. And Be could I ask, like, what do you consider an athlete being for NASCAR racing? Like, how do they prepare for that and make the endurance to last for those 24 hours like you spoke about? Well, let's see. They got well, to do a lot of workouts, you know, uh, lift weights, build up their muscles. <laughs> Yeah, if you <laughs> if you work out a bunch, that, that builds up a lot of energy. And is it that, more like cardio, so you can make sure that you keep stamina for like how fast those race cars are going? Yeah. I would like to add something over here. According to him, I'm sorry, but he said that you have to build your lots of muscles. You don't have to build lots of muscles. You have to do good uh -huh. cardio. And according to you know, sit for 24 hours and you know drive the way for tw you know be concentrated and drive. Have you ever seen a any racer who has like a good who has a good physique but he's not like pumped up or who's you know having muscles and driving the car they are very you know toned up in phys in physique so again i would say that um you don't have to build muscles to you know sit into the car and drive it you have to just be uh, mentally prepared for it and i personally believe you don't even have to be fit that's my personal opinion if you're driving a car if you're a good driver you can have you can be you know you can ha you can be overweight but still if you're a good driver you can drive well and that's why i personally think that they are not athletes at all okay syed um i'm just gonna get right to this <laughs> okay yeah um let me tell you something uh being being fit uh, you probably don't need to be muscular but you need to have lots of strength and whatnot because, well, there is one thing you, you're not, you're forgetting. Yeah. Crashes. You see, let me in racing that crashes are are real. You know, they're they're huge. They've killed drivers before. And well, you you can you gotta have you have to be fit to some degree if you want a chance of at at least making out of those crashes alive 
or at least uninjured. My friend, again, okay, look, crashes and incidences occur in daily lives as well. Mm -hmm. You cannot relate those things to be an athlete over here because you can drive a car and if you get into a crash, God forsake, then you, again, you have to come out of that crash as well. So again, I'm gonna ask you, are you gonna be an athlete then? No, you cannot be an athlete. An athlete puts on lots of work, hard work on his body, on his physique, on his mentality, on, on whatever sports that he is playing. And it takes a lot of hard work to do that. I'm not saying that these drivers are not hardworking, but they are not athletes because they are not having anything related to their body. They're just driving a car. If I, for 10 years, keep driving a good car, I mean, I can also go, go there and try and, you know, give it, give it a try for it. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to be ca called as an athlete because I'm not doing anything else except for just going, uh, sitting in the car and just doing laps and laps, 10 laps, 20 laps each day. So that's my personal opinion. I would like to hear you. Look, all right, Syed, yeah. I'm going to make this very clear. Those NASCAR drivers and other racers, they do not drive for 20 laps, okay? They drive for well up to 500 laps. Okay. And these, and these races, they, some of them go well into midnight, like the Coca-Cola 600 at Charlotte, okay? Do you think, I mean, do you think you could stay awake for that long? So I mean, you can stay awake if you're driving from here to a long place. So if you are staying awake, so you are an athlete. That means, so if you are staying awake from here, and if you're like traveling from, the, from here to just, for example, um, Alaska, so I'm very far away. Mm. So you're an athlete then, because you're traveling for around like, that's also around 500 laps, I, more than that, I believe. So you are better than them then, Sorry. because you are traveling more than them. And now you are also up, you're also awake, so you're an athlete. <laughs> I, I don't understand one thing from your end. Syed, that, okay, you let can, me make something clear. Yeah. Okay, these, these NASCAR drivers and, and other racers, yeah. they're not racing for the heck of it, okay? They're racing for a prize a trophy, a championship even. See, athletes, they, they compete. Every time they go out, there's always something on the line. And, whenever, and these drivers, they, they have to be in top condition. That way, they can, that way they can be at their best, you know, uh, make, it, make it the whole race, uh, survive whatever hardships they encounter in a wreck. That way, in the end, they can have the best chance they can get of taking the checkered flag first, claiming the trophy and the com and the coveted win, and eventually, uh, who knows? Maybe they might could make it to the championship four and have a chance at the championship. Of course, that didn't really amount to much this year. But my point still stands, though. Well, Syed, so well, I've made my argument. I'm gonna have to cut What's you off yours? because I think we're getting to the end of it. But I mean. We're getting close, but finish I off think, your thoughts. I, I think um, what my personal opinion is that driving cannot make you an athlete. Even if they are driving for like 500 laps, even if they are staying up, even if they have to, st and like we don't have time, otherwise we'd have, we would have talked about it. Like he said that um, the physical strength, I wanted, wanted to know what kind of physical strength he was talking about, but let's just, you know, from my personal opinion, I don't think that uh, the, even the, whatever race it is, it's NASCAR, F1, drag racing, they are not athletes. An athlete is a person who has to do something that is related to his physical body, his physical strength, he's working on it. And for me, that's an athlete, proper athlete. Driving is not an athlete. Yeah, the kind of strength I'm talking about just, just before we leave, it's toughness so that you don't get hurt that easily. Okay, you gotta be tough. I mean, you can't just, you can't just complain because you, you hurt your finger while driving. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I think that's about it. Well, it was nice talking to you, man. Well, yes. I'm so glad we got to talk about that argument and see what was going on with it, but that's all we have time for this segment. We'll be right back with more on the A-State Sports Take right after this. ASU TV, shows like Red Wolf Roundtable, ASU TV News, West Side Football, and more. Gain real life experience while doing what you love. 
Get involved with ASU TV today. ASU TV, covering all your favorite sports. From Red Wolf Roundtable to West Side Football and more, ASU TV has you covered. Tune in now to ASU TV for news and coverage on these sports and more. to deliver the latest news on A-State sports, ranging from football, basketball, baseball, and more. I'm your host, Tristan Harlan, alongside your other host, Cooper Mounter. Red Wolf Roundtable is your local sports source. Tune in to Red Wolf Roundtable to get your fix on sports talk and news. Hello and welcome back to A-State Sports Take. I'm Austin Sweat, and in this segment, I'm joined by Jordan Moore and Jacob Tester. And the topic for this segment is, who's the greatest sportscaster of all time? Let's hear your opinions. Uh, I'll start us off with a guy that's been around television for a very long time, actually since 1971, and that's Al Michaels. Okay. Uh, he's done primetime football for the last 16 years until this last year, which he recently moved to Amazon Prime and is now doing the Thursday night football game. Okay. But he has also done a legendary call such as known as the miracle on ice uh he's done nba games as well so i mean his diversity in all the things that he's done and for his longevity and also knowing having big calls such as the miracle on ice along with many others i feel like you have to put him up there as one of the top but i have him as my top yeah, absolutely. I love Al Michaels. I love what he's been able to do for um, not just uh, the NFL, but also, you know, what you talked about with the Miracle on Ice doing all that kind of stuff. Al Michaels, fantastic. But I've got a guy personally who every time I hear him on a call, every time I hear his voice, it's just automatically recognizable. And it's not just because he's been in video games. It's not just because he has all these accolades. It's not just because he was the winner of the National Sportscaster of the Year Award in 2007 and 2019, but it's because he is so phenomenal at coming up with analogies and all kinds of different stuff just right on the spot off the top of his head, and that is Kevin Harlan. You hear his voice, and you know exactly who it is from the moment he starts talking till the moment that it's done, whether it's NCAA football, whether it's NFL, whether it's NBA, or it's coverage in March Madness with some NCAA basketball. You know his voice from the moment it hits your ear over those speakers well I like Kevin Harlan but I have one little pick that I have with him as sometimes it feels like he over exaggerates moments it mm. feels like he gets way too hype in moments that aren't as important and for me that kind of like throws me off whenever I'm watching it he's a great commentator obviously he's been around for the longest time yeah but I don't like the fact that he has so many energetic moments because I feel like it takes away from those bigger plays when you've kind of already heard him do things that are very, sound very, very similar. Yeah, I agree with, I agree that he does have a lot of, you know, exciting vocals and he does that at sometimes some not so exciting moments, but in a way, that is a great way to draw a viewer back in. If they've kind of, you know, lost their attention to the game, you hear this big time thing happen. You hear, maybe it's just a crazy layup from somebody uh, like a John Moran or from a LeBron James or someone like that, you know, that's a big time playmaker. Maybe it's just one of those little plays that isn't so giant in the grand scheme of the game, but it's going to bring people back in and keep their eyes glued to the television. Whenever you have a guy that's as dynamic as that, I think that, um, I, I really do think that it helps viewer retention. I think it helps those stations and whoever has Kevin Harlan, you know, I, I really think that it helps them retain viewership and continue to make money and profit through that way. 
And then for going back to Al Michaels, since we touched on Kevin Harlan. For sure. The m most watched sporting event in this country is primetime football. Absolutely. I don't feel like anybody can argue with that, unless you're talking like finals or any postseason stuff that you kind of want to exclude. Just like regular season style games, the most watched thing is uh, primetime football, which, which I mentioned for 16 years, Al Michael was a part of that until he moved to Thursday Night Football with Amazon Prime. When he was there, they won a total of 30 sports Emmys for primetime football, as I mentioned, the Absolutely. most watched for regular mm -hmm. season. So I feel like when you're involved at the top of the game, you it just kind of puts you above everybody else. Absolutely, for sure. But I, I also think that you put anybody in that booth and it's still going to be the most okay. viewed thing on television. I think that, you know, th there's just such an enigma that comes with primetime football. I mean, you've looked at the numbers this year. He's not involved in it this year. He got moved to a different branch onto a different night. And you look at the numbers and they have been just as good, if not better, than they have been in previous years. You know, so I think you can put anybody in that booth and it's going to continue to draw those numbers. Now, that's absolutely no dig on Al Michaels. Like I said, I respect the guy. I think he's a phenomenal broadcaster, but I do think that in the grand scheme of things, I think you can put anybody in that booth and it's going to draw the same ratings. It's going to get the same Emmys. I think it's going to, I think just the nature of what it is, is what is giving it all of those awards and giving it all of those things. The thing is though, you can't just put anybody. He earned that spot as the top dog and he definitely showed it through his 16 seasons there. Absolutely. And the only reason that he got taken off of it was because they were too scared of his age and his longevity. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, screw it. I'll just go do it somewhere else since you guys <laughs> don't want to offer me a contract. Yeah. And that's the reason he got taken off. Uh, you can make the argument that they would be have very similar ratings. But the fact of the matter is, is he earned that spot. And so not everybody can just earn the best job in America when it comes Absolutely. to Absolutely. And, you know, I think to, to, to kind of touch on that with Kevin Harlan himself, you know, we do, you talk about how he was able to earn that spot on primetime. Well, Kevin Harlan was able to earn the main guy for March Madness. He is that guy. He is the one. And March Madness is one of the most viewed broadcasts uh, in, in the nation as well as primetime football. I mean, you look at the national championship, there are a ton of people that will do watch parties that will gather for it. I mean, it's the exact same. I mean, I think looking at, you know, viewership and looking at that kind of stuff isn't really too fair whenever you talk about these sportscasters. It's more about what they can do. And I think both of these guys are on very close to equal terms on what they can do. And I think that, you know, I, I think that bringing up the, the Emmys and bringing up the, 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 the viewership and all that stuff doesn't really have the same, uh, doesn't really have the same juice as if we were just talking about how they were as sports commentators. And, um, um, you know, I, I really feel like whenever I watch Al Michaels, I think that he's really fantastic. But there's one thing that that just kind of bugs me a little bit about Al Michaels. And that is, you know, sometimes in in football, he gets away from the game a little bit. He talks a little too much about the personal experiences, about the things that are going on around the league. I mean, whenever he was calling the game with the commanders, he talked about Dan Snyder at least 10 to 15 times during the game. Like, I feel like to a degree, Al Michaels gets sidetracked from the game a little bit. And whenever you look at somebody like Kevin Harlan, who's done radio, who's done TV, who's done all of that stuff, he's a lot less to get distracted from the game. So even though he has those big pop-off moments like you were talking about earlier, I think to a degree he stays focused on the game, he stays focused on what's going on, and he's able to capitalize on those big-time plays. And I think the difference in that is kind of the pace of the game. Absolutely. Basketball's pace of the game is a lot quicker, so there's a lot more that goes on that you can talk about. In mm -hmm. football, there's timeouts, injuries, uh, the commercial breaks that slow things down, half times, so there's breaks in between the plays. So you have to find those types of things to be able to talk about so you're not kind of just repeating the same stuff over and over again, kind of stuck on the same topic. And I feel like his ability to adapt and make the topic at least relevant to kind of what we're seeing, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, he talks all about the league. Not everybody has the time to sit down and watch every single game. Maybe they want to know what kind of happens. So I feel like his adaptability to like keep the topic relevant 
while still being able to keep mm -hmm. up with the game is what makes him so great. Yeah, and I think you look at uh, I think you look at Al Michaels and what he's able to do in that instance in in what you're talking about there. But I think the only problem is that sometimes the things that he says and he talks about, especially as he's gotten a little bit older in age, like more recently, um, he's been talking over the football that's being played with those instances. And you know, like whenever whenever I'm sitting down to watch football, I love hearing those stories. Or when I'm sitting down and watching basketball, I love to hear those stories. But I I love to hear what's going on in the game more than I would like to hear, you know, just those stories and stuff. And, you know, I, like I said, I 100% respect Al Michaels and I love him. But I mean, for me personally, I think I, I just have to give it to Kevin Harlan because just the ability that he has, he tells stories, he does all that stuff like you're supposed to do as a good sportscaster. You know, there's a reason he's won that award twice, you know, uh, voted by his peers. You know, the, the, there's a reason why he's so widely respected and why both of these guys do so much. And it's because they are storytellers at heart. But I think that for Kevin Harlan, I mean, I love, love hearing that voice. There, I think that there is no better voice in football or basketball than Kevin Harlan and what he's able to do. The way that he sounds, the way that it's so unique, the way that he calls games, I feel like is unrivaled. And that's why I think that Kevin Harlan is the best of all time. And so you, do you think some of the... Um area of his the distraction comes with age do you think it's come with age or it's just kind of always been there and it's just kind of gotten more apparent with age well i think it's always been there but i think that it's gotten worse with age okay. but i mean like the you know I, I think that al michaels has always been a phenomenal storyteller and and that's something that i greatly respect of him but i feel like as it's coming on and as i've grown up you know i i feel like it's i feel like it's gotten into a little bit of a different kind of distraction Okay, and then obviously we're talking about two of the greatest. Absolutely. Uh, so we're being very nitpicky here when yeah. we're talking about them. <laughs> if you were talking about radio, I think I'd agree with you more because radio, you need to know every single thing that happens. Mm -hmm. With TV, you can obviously see it. So I don't, that's why I don't see it as much of a problem. Absolutely. I mean, both are obviously very great sports. As you said, yours, is, yours has been going for a long time, and he's been able to move to wherever he needs to. Mo one of the most iconic voices in sports guys. But I think that's about all the time we have for this segment. We'll be right back with some more A-State Sports Takes right after this. ASU TV. Shows like Red Wolf Roundtable, ASU TV News, Westside Football, and more. Gain real life experience while doing what you love. Get involved with ASU TV today. ASU TV, covering all your favorite sports. From Red Wolf Roundtable to West Side Football and more, ASU TV has you covered. Tune in now to ASU TV for news and coverage on these sports and more. to deliver the latest news on A-State sports, ranging from football, basketball, baseball, and more. I'm your host, Tristan Harlan, alongside your other host, Cooper Mellor. Red Wolf Roundtable is your local sports source. Tune in to Red Wolf Roundtable to get your fix on sports talk and news.
Welcome back to the A-State Sports Take. I'm Jordan Moore. In this segment, I'm joined by Stephen Pasco and Easton John. And the topic for this segment is, quite simply, who is the ultimate sports goat? I'm going to let you go first on this one, bud. I'm going to have to go with my Jamaican brother, Usain Bolt, 100-meter <laughs> world record holder. No one's came close to my boy. He's a fast man. I want to hear what you got to say. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> you, there's, there's Michael Jordan, Tom Brady. Bro, and Tom Brady doesn't do Kobe that. Bryant, and then and Ken Griffey Jr., and you say Usain Bolt. I'm saying Usain Bolt. Usain, all right, well, I'm going with the ultimate sports winner, and that is Tom Brady. I know we hate him. Everybody in the crew hates Tom Brady. But, hey, <laughs> our producer in the back is clapping. But he has won seven Super Bowls. It's so frustrating to watch this guy win because he does it in such awesome fashion. And it's just it's, it's so frustrating to see him winning in the Super Bowl every single year. Mm. And he is so he's, – he's a grandpa, and he's, he's leading in passing yards last year. So how does that make sense? I mean, he's re-aging, I feel like. He looks like he's 35 years old. He's playing like he's just got out of college. And it's just it's unbelievable to watch. Can I ask you a quick Host, question? What do you got to say about that? You know, that? Here, here's, here's the thing, okay? You know, I, I feel like on one hand, Usain Bolt is, isn't even the greatest Olympian of all time. Uh, I, I, don't think that he's, I don't think that he's the GOAT. I think Michael Phelps, Michael is, Phelps. is unbelievably exactly. when you the, the, the Olympic GOAT. And I don't even think Michael Phelps touches the top five in terms of all sports GOATs. So I, I, don't, I, don't really know about, uh, I don't really know about you over there, Mr. Pasco. Yeah, but, would... uh, and, and personally, Easton, I think you've got a little bit of a problem with, what? Uh, with 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 overthinking and thinking America is the only sport in the entire world. You know, I, I think that football is, you know, American football is cool and all, but, you know, the only people who play it are Americans. Yeah, How can you, there, there's, not, there's not a sample size. Here's what I'm going to say. There, the, in, for, for both of your arguments, okay, Easton, you know, there, there's somebody that could argue maybe, you know, um, maybe, uh, sorry, give me a second, I'm, I'm blanking. Maybe, you know, Peyton Manning is up there. Maybe Drew Brees is up there. You know, there are people that, Heck, that no. talk about about and and I'm I'm forgetting right now the um the 49ers quarterback that, uh, that Joe Montana. So Joe Montana, there you go. Thank you very much. You know, there are people that can the argue that they're the goats. Okay, you know, mm -hmm. for you over there, Mr. Steven, I think that there are a lot of people uh, that that can argue against Usain Bolt in, in terms of the goats. But here's the thing. In my opinion, there is one guy who is undoubtedly in his sport the greatest of all time. Who is it? That, <laughs> my good and humble friends, is Muhammad Ali. He is the goat of all goats. He went 56 for 61 in his fights. He's not the best fights. boxer. R Floyd really? <laughs> Muhammad Ali's not the best boxer of all time. Floyd Mayweather is 50 and 0. Oh, he has a zero in the L category. Muhammad Ali, fantastic boxer whenever he was in his prime. But when he started to age, he started to rack up some losses. When Floyd Mayweather started to age, he kept the, the goose egg, the zero, on his loser board. But I want to go back to Usain Bolt because I feel like we – Yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> Usain Bolt – so why do you believe Usain Bolt? Well, a, first of all, winning any Olympic gold medal, that's a pretty big feat, right? Mm -hmm. Some may even say that's better than the Super Bowl. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying Olympic gold medals have a standard of one of the greatest human achievements always, dating back to the – the freaking ancient Greeks, bro. They were running naked around there getting gold medals. <laughs> so that's got to hold some value. Yeah. Um, I say that again because no one has even came close. Do you know how fast 9.58 seconds for 100 meters is? Guy, can you, can you grasp that? One, two, All right. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine and a quarter. Boom, nine seconds. That's pretty fast. That is pretty fast. He just went from what, what point A to point B in that span That's of time. That's pretty fast. Yeah. So, okay, I want to kind of go back on Tom Brady here. because right, yeah, let's go back to TV. Yeah, because he's been and he's he's stayed in the league for 20 years yeah. like that's, that's a lot of years and him playing when he's 45 like that's unheard of i like i think tom brady even though we all hate him but we all have to respect that this guy knows how to win he knows how to manage football and he knows he can he doesn't even need a coach out there and he could still win that's you the know thing what i think 
Just to I, mean, I didn't mean to cut you off. Either. Yeah, no, you're good. I think um, I think goats know when to stop and hang up the cleats. And I think Tom Brady should have hung up the cleats last year. I mean, something Muhammad Ali. I don't think goats uh, break up with their super hot wives <laughs> just to go fight. under 500. <laughs> and so I think that that was a big mistake. In yeah. The goat. Yeah, I, it was a big mistake. I mean, people are going to see this as like as this season being like, why shouldn't uh, Tom Brady should have retired this season? And I, I think he should have. But you can't deny that this guy is still the greatest of all time. Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I think Muhammad Ali is a great boxer and has the most legendary fights of all time. Mm. But he's doing the same thing Tom Brady is doing, I would believe, because he just – Muhammad Ali didn't know when to hang up the gloves. And that is – that's the same thing that Tom Brady is doing right now. He, does, he wants to keep playing. He's forcing himself to keep playing. And I think Muhammad Ali is a great boxer, but he just had some loses in his lose category that shouldn't have been there. So here, here's the thing: Tom Brady also had some loses in his lose. Oh yeah, a bunch. Been there. A bunch. He, he, he definitely did. He lost in the playoffs a lot. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he didn't even make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Okay, here, here's, here's, here, here's, here's the thing. Muhammad Ali won his last fight, by the mm -hmm. way. Just yeah, thought I'd I let know. you know that. Know. He didn't, uh, he, he didn't, you know, hang up the cleats too late or too early. He went he, out with a win. He went out with a win. Okay, and here's the thing about Muhammad Ali. He is undoubtedly the greatest boxer of all time because of his achievements and also because of the person he was out of the ring. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali was a pioneer for everything that has to do with activism mm -hmm. for the black community. Exactly. Yep. He was incredible whenever it comes to peace during the Vietnam War. He was an incredible person on and off mm -hmm. of the, uh, in and out of the ring, my bad, if you may excuse me. Mm -hmm. He was a phenomenal champion. Yep. And, you know, I think whenever you compare his legacy to the other ones in the boxing community, sure, there are people that are undefeated. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, Floyd Mayweather might have fought some good people, yes. but he does not have near the resume as Muhammad Ali does. Okay. Muhammad Ali has a phenomenal, phenomenal resume, and he lost oh, yeah. to some of the greatest of all time. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and here's the bottom line in, in, in my argument against you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, you know, Tom Brady is extremely respectable, but I think that, you know, there, there's just too small of a sample size. He plays against, you know, he plays against one country. It's a one country sport. There's no competition against other people in other generations or uh, anything like that. I didn't mean to say generations in other countries, in other worlds, other atmospheres. He plays in one place. I mean, he's played in, you know, Germany and Mexico City and London, but that's mm -hmm. not against those types of people. Yeah. He's only playing against the one type of of person and and that's my biggest draw against Tom Brady is that he doesn't have any true experience against people from other nations mm -hmm. and in your side with Usain Bolt he's lost but but he's, he's he has the world record sure yeah, but yeah, I'm not oh, yeah. gonna call you know but I'm not gonna call Katie Ledecky the greatest swimmer of all time just because she has the just because she has the women's world record sure she might be the greatest but, women's yeah. swimmer of all time but she's not the greatest swimmer of all time there mm -hmm. are people that are better than her and that's been proven especially at last year's Olympics when she was beaten but just because she has a world record does not mean that she's the greatest of all time and you know so I think I by far on that. in in the ring out of the ring in in with your with, with the people that you've made an impact with inside with your accolades I think there's nobody greater than Muhammad Ali I'll say this Muhammad Ali going out as a fighter with a win is something that some fighters can't say that happened I mean we just watched last week one of the UFC fights uh, a fighter was retiring and he got beat he and that's how most fighters go out they go out on the, on their head on the campus looking up at the at the arena and they're knocked out. Muhammad Ali having a win as his last fight is unbearably one of the one of his greatest accomplishments and that's how you go on top. Go out on top. I just like to think that Tom Brady winning seven championships. That mean out of 32 teams, one team is a winner. I know that he doesn't play against Mexico, but someone that's from Mexico or France or whatever, but I just think that Tom Brady playing against 32 other teams that are going for the same goal, and that is winning the Super Bowl, 
is one of the greatest accomplishments that a sports player can have. I mean, that can be said about the Olympics too, bro. Mm -hmm. You're going up against like hundreds of countries. I mean, millions of people mm -hmm. dedicating years to run for 10 mm -hmm. seconds. And then mm -hmm. if you mess up your start, you mess up. If you don't get out of the blocks fast enough, like, I mean, I feel like there's commonality in both of those, yeah. like multiple people, one goal, and it's everything on the line. Mm -hmm. And you have to predict every part, perfect every part. I mean, well, guys, I enjoyed the time, but I think that's yeah. all we have for this segment and this episode of A-State Sports Take.